Hi and welcome to this lesson on graphing quadratics, which always fascinates me because the order we do this in is somewhat bizarre. For those of you who are listening and hearing strange footsteps in the background, that is my gorgeous Poochie, otherwise known as Zero, who's decided he's going to come and help me record this video. And now he's leaving. Anyway, back to reality. So, we normally, bizarrely, teach the whole concept of solving quadratics before graphing quadratics, and I don't understand that at all. Whenever I teach this, and hopefully those of you who have ever taught this by me, will find me teaching this graphing stuff first. But... We're following along with the Cambridge Essentials textbook series, and for those who are being taught by me, congratulations, there is the work I wish you to do. But, for those of you who are not, let's recap what we talked about previously. So, as I say in the previous lesson or video, we looked at solving quadratics. And what does it mean to solve quadratics? When we are solving quadratics, we are effectively putting something like x squared plus 3x minus 2 equals 0. And that information there, because it's equal to 0, helps me solve for a specific point on the graph. And there is my graph, and then when it crosses here, we are looking specifically for the x values of where it crosses the x-axis. Now, there's lots more theory behind this, but... As I say, we are looking at finding where the quadratic crosses the x-axis. Believe it or not, all quadratics are actually born from the same single shape. And as I say here, there is my y equals x squared. All quadratics have an axis of symmetry. This axis of symmetry is really important, and it is used in turning point form and all sort of stuff. So if we look now, what's really important to note is I'm going to draw a straight line here, okay? And that is our tangent to the point zero, zero. So I've drawn a tangent to the point zero, zero. Why? Because I know that a tangent at that point gives me a gradient equal zero. Now, while that's not necessarily hugely important now, I promise you later on, it does become very important in the subject called differentiation. So turning points have a gradient of zero, be it a maximum or a minimum, doesn't matter. It crosses through the point zero, zero. It has a minimum at the point zero, zero. A great thing to know is this axis of symmetry passes through there. So it has an axis of symmetry along the line x equals 0. It is an even function, and we'll come back to the idea of even and odd functions in later videos, but it's always useful now to start thinking of this as an even function. And it has one turning point. It also is symmetrical. Now, obviously, I know we've already said here an axis of symmetry, but the great thing is the distance from this point away from the y-axis and the distance of this point away from the y-axis is identical. So if we know that information, if we know that this quadratic has a basic form, we can start looking at the general idea of well, how does this apply to other quadratics. In a previous video, we've noticed that maths is going to try and trick us. There is a big fat trick in here because they can write quadratics in all sorts of different ways. This is the form we would like it to be in, all right? Something x squared plus something x plus some sort of number equals zero. And the way we normally write this is ax squared plus bx plus c equals zero. That's the format we want it to be in. Once it's in that format, we can use the cross method, the t method, the quadratic formula, and all sorts of different stuff. But because maths is going to try and trick you, they will write it in lots of different ways. And that one equation can be written in all of these totally different ways. Hard to imagine x plus 5 equals 2 over x is exactly the same as that. But if we have a look at we have x plus 5 is equal to 2 on x. Well, I don't like that divide by x. So to get rid of it, I'm going to multiply everything by x. And remember, I have to multiply absolutely everything by x. So I get x squared plus 5x is equal to 2. And then x squared plus 5x minus 2 is equal to 0, and lo and behold, we have what we started with. More likely, though, those equations aren't written in a format that we actually like. Right? It just shows some quadratic expressed in a different way. None of those are particularly useful to us. However, that's not true of all ways of expressing a quadratic. And if we look at this here, this form is incredibly important. So, I'm going to say to you now, we will have two graphs on each of the following axes. One of them will be y equals x squared, which is our reference graph, and one of them will be that graph moved in some way, shape, or form. So, if I look at this y equals x minus 1 squared, and I start to look at things like turning points, what I've noticed is this whole graph seems to be moved one place to the right, which seems somewhat counterintuitive, because that says minus 1. 
And that's part of where math starts to come in. There are shortcuts for all of these type of things. When you do methods three and four, it's great because we show you why it becomes minus one, but it's way beyond the scope of this course at this moment of time. But this value inside my bracket seems to talk about some type of horizontal translation. Is there another example? Well, yeah, let's actually see what happens when we move it the other way. So again, here is my graph of y equals x squared. The blue graph now seems to be the same graph, but moved two to the left. And what do we notice? We get y equals x plus two squared, right? So we've moved two to the left, which is normally negative, but inside my brackets, it's a positive. All this seems to be doing is looking at something to do with my turning point. We notice that this turning point has moved to negative two. It was at zero. It was at zero in an x term. We'll come back to the y term in a moment. Now there another example. Well, yeah, now let's start looking at what happens when I take my reference graph, which is y equals x squared, and start to move it up and down. Well, what do we notice here? Well, we notice that when I have y equals x squared minus three, a number written outside of that x squared term seems to relate to a vertical translation. And because that is a negative three, I am delighted to see that actually in this situation, my graphs move down. That's what I was expecting. So it would suggest if I was going to now have my reference graph here, once again, y equals x squared, and move it up, that I'd be looking for y is equal to x squared plus four because I've moved four in a vertical sense. And lo and behold, when I check my graph, yes. So we now have some sort of general code. y equals x minus b squared plus c suggests that this value here is a horizontal translation and this value here is a vertical translation. But we've got to be very careful because I'm going to put an A in here. Now, why am I going to put an A in there? Because although we can move graphs horizontally and vertically, we can also stretch them, right? And that stretching is called a dilation. And we need to be careful that we take that into account. But let's not rush. Combining these two then, as you can see, I've started with my reference graph of y equals x squared there, and now my minimum seems to have gone to two, four. It's moved two places that way and four places up. So let's see if we can just guess this without looking at the rest of the video. So y is equal to x. It's at plus two, so I'm gonna make it minus two, which seems to be counterintuitive. And then I'm gonna do plus four, and hopefully, lo and behold, there is my graph. Now again, that was more by luck than judgment, all right? I already knew the question. It would appear that this graph here has had no dilation applied to it, all right? So that's quite lucky. One last example, just to check, what do we get here? We've got two comma negative six, and what do we notice inside the brackets? Well, we have negative two and negative six, which is what we're expecting. Now, this thing here is called turning point form. And it's really, really important to us. It's really, really helpful. Uh, and I'll explain why in a moment. Now, when we move graphs around, they're actually called transformations. We're actually transforming one graph into another. We're, we're turning it. Like Wolverine, when he pulls those things out of his fingers, he's transforming into a homicidal killer. That's a whole new discussion outside of this. All right? When we move horizontally or vertically, we need to make sure we understand that they're called translations. And when we stretch the graph, we need to understand it's called a dilation. Now, dilations can happen from the x-axis and from the y-axis. And by that, I mean, if you look here at our reference graph of y equals x squared, the blue graph seems to be stretching away from the x-axis here. And once again, if we look at y equals x squared, our blue graph seems to be stretching away from the y-axis. And this subtle distinction is really, really important. But probably beyond the scope of this lesson. So as I said a moment ago, completing the square turning point form, well, this turning point form is actually really important. Turning a normal quadratic x squared plus 4x minus 6 into something that looks like a x minus b squared plus c actually is fabulously important. It's called completing the square, and the great thing is that's coming soon, right? It's a great way for us to find the maximum or minimum of the graph. This format here, whenever we see it, I would have a huge smiley face. Why? 
Well, because it's actually going to help me find all sorts of information. So let's just go back to this reading the turning point four. Here's example number one. What do we notice? Well, if I was now going to draw a sketch, there's my sketch. I know it's minus three, four, which means it's actually going to cross at positive three. Or rather, it's not going to cross at, it's going to have a minimum at positive three and four. So I now know there is my minimum. So I know that's my minimum point there. Can I find my y-axis intercept? Well, if remember, if you want to find a y-axis intercept, you put x is equal to zero. And what would we end up with? Zero minus three is minus three. Square that is nine. Nine plus four is 13. My graph is going to be wildly out of scale. But the general idea now is our turning point form has allowed me to do that. Now, what I would need to do is actually label that as three comma four for an exam. Here, what do we notice once again? My turning point is at positive four, so it means it's going to be a minimum at negative four. I'm going to have to take this a bit further down because it's going to be at negative three. So there is my minimum. Can I find my y-axis intercept? Yes, I'm going to make x equals zero. So when x is equal to zero, I get four squared. It's 16 minus three, which is uh, six. Uh, what did I say? 16 minus three is 13. So again, wildly inaccurate, but there's 13. So I know my graph is hopefully going to look something like that. And again, although you've labeled the axis on the y and the x, you're advised to put minus four, minus three in brackets there. This one here, well, same idea. What am I going to end up with? My turning point is still easy to see. It's going to cross, or oh, have a minimum at three and six. So there is my minimum. Still can put x equals zero in, and I get zero minus three, which is minus three squared, nine times it by two, which is 18 plus six, which is 24. All right, so way, way up here is the number 24. And what I'm going to notice is my graph is going to do something like that. All right, now that looks absolutely dreadful. Don't forget 3 comma 6 there. But what we notice in this situation is that that value 2 stands for my dilation. So this is my stretching, and it's stretching my graph away from the x-axis. Now, axis of symmetry. We already know that the quadratic has a line of symmetry down the center. All right? We knew that, and there is always going to be an axis of symmetry. But as it turns out, the axis of symmetry crosses directly through the minimum or the maximum. All right? So if I know my minimum or maximum, I can actually label my uh, axis of symmetry within about three and a half seconds. Wow, that is awesome. Okay, So if I had y is equal to 2 x plus 3 squared minus 6 and that's not this graph here by the way so I don't think it's that graph there I've just made this example up then what I now know is that my turning point of that graph will be at minus 3 comma minus 6 and I now know that my axis of symmetry is uh, going to be at x is equal to minus 3. Well that was awesome. What about if you don't have the completing the square form for the axis of symmetry and I have intercept form? Well, the great thing is this, is because the graph is symmetrical, if I knew that this was minus two, for example, and I knew that that was six, then I know my axis of symmetry falls halfway between those points. And how do you find halfway between those points? Well, strangely, you add the two together and halve them. So that would give me two, which would suggest that my axis of symmetry is at x equals two. Once I know that information, I can actually then go away and find that minimum point there. How? Well, fingers crossed, they'll probably have told me what the function is. Substitute two in, and that will give me my y value. There we go, quadratics. Love it, love it, love it, love it, love it. Really looking forward to a video that's coming up called I'm Completing the Square. But for now, that is Graphing Quadratics. I look forward to seeing you next time. Hi, and thanks very much for watching this, another video by me, The Maths Guru. If you would like to see more videos, why not subscribe and get regular updates? Otherwise, hey, click on the left and watch our next video. Okay, thanks very much. Have a good day.